Praise the Lord. We welcome you all to this gathering in the name of Jesus. We thank the Lord for the privilege to come your way again this day. Uh, those of you joining us from different platforms, this is Singles Online Outreach, bringing you the Word of God. Our focus is to look at guidance for a godly marriage. Shall we bow our heads to pray? Our Father, we thank you for today and the privilege of fellowship you have brought us into with several of your children across the globe, wherever they are joining us from. We want to thank you for everyone. Holy Spirit, we turn to you that you will bring increase to your word in our hearts. Let there be understanding and let there be grace to do that which you are instructing us. As we consider the subject of Christian marriage, and how to have a godly home. We are trusting that your word will guide us. Holy Spirit, help us even this day. And may your name be exalted, for we pray with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, we welcome all of you joining us onto this program. This is Singles Online Outreach, bringing you the word of God from Peace House Revival Labels Abuja. Our focus on this meeting is to ensure that all our children out there, young ones, you don't miss the will of God for your life in marriage. Marriage is a very critical aspect of our lives and we cannot walk into it unguided. We found this opportunity a good opportunity to bring you the understanding of what God wants to achieve in your homes. In the August edition, 
we began to look at the word of God as the servant of the Lord, Brother Gilea Coney, uh, brought us understanding, considering general principles of Christian marriage. We looked at the place of marriage in the life of a believer. And we concluded that section looking at the need to rest, the going to sleep, in order to ensure that you allow God to bring you into his perfect will in the area of marriage. This September edition, we want to come your way again. Our focus this time is to look at knowing the will of God for you in marriage. How do I know the will of God for the person he will have me marry? How will I be sure that God is leading me? How will I get to discover that this is what God wants me to do? This is the person he will have me to marry so that I will enter into the fullness of God's purpose for my life. For all our single brothers and sisters out there, we pray that you will take your time again, bring your writing materials as you invite your friends again, we sit around the word of God for this critical fellowship. Your future depends so much on this. If you will be a happy brother, a happy sister in life, you need to discover what is the will of God for my life in marriage? As we invite our brother to guide us into this discussion today, we pray that you will be attentive and don't allow yourself to be distracted on this matter. We call our brother Bilea Coney to guide us in this discussion. You are welcome, sir. Shall we pray together? Our Father, our God, we are grateful to you for the way You've been guiding and leading us even as we continue these studies trying to find biblical guidelines for choosing a marriage partner and the biblical guidelines for the relationship thereafter. Our Father and our God want to pray that even today as we look on the specifics of how to know the specific person that you have arranged for your children. We want to pray that there will be light, there will be revelation, there will be illumination from your spirit. Thank you for hearing us, for we have prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to thank God for the chance and the privilege he has given to us to continue this uh, series of studies. And by our last study, we ended on the fact that God must work both on you as a brother to bring the revelation of the sister to your heart and the same God must work on the sister before it can be a correct relationship. Now you will notice that from that, it means that anyone that God has not worked upon and introduced to you, even if he be a Christian, it is not yet correct to rush at her. Now if we cannot even rush at a Christian sister because she is a Christian, until God has worked on her and prepared and convinced her that she is the right person, and God had also spoken to you that, you know, I mean, spoken to the sister that you are the right person, you can see that there is no space even for you to contemplate a marriage with an unbeliever. I'll be looking at that as we go on now. But uh, the stage in which we have reached, I still want you to turn to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 23. Genesis 2 and verse 23. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. What we 
wants to begin to study is how can we become so sure? How can we become so clear and so specific as regards who the Lord has brought or who the Lord has prepared for your life? Take note, he said this. And that's very interesting to me. He didn't say these. He was not, you know, flipping in between two or three girls and said these. No, he said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Now you might say, well, he had no alternative because it was only uh, the woman they brought. Now that's not the issue I want to trace with you. What I want to trace with you is, how could we become so definite as to be able to also say, this is the bone of my bones and the flesh of of my flesh. How can you be so definite as regards the person that God is bringing to your life? Now, in, in other words, how can we discern the specific person, the specific will of God as regards whether it is this brother or it is that sister? And we are so definite that yes, I'm not making a mistake, neither am I making a wrong choice you know, in my life at this point. Now, let me lay this foundation as I go on to deal with this. Number one, we notice that it was God that did that work. And also it is God that brought them together. Which means it is God that will bring this revelation of the right person to your life and the revelation of the right sister or the right brother unto your life. Now, let's take some little examples while we are tracing uh, how to be sure, how to be specific in knowing the will of God right now. Now, before I return to take some examples, I'd like us to turn to the book of Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. And we'll read verse 1 and verse 2 uh, to lay a general foundation for becoming, you know, so clear and so specific as regards what the will of God for your life would be in choosing a life partner. Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, let's and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. By the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, looking at the passage we have read, we are going to try to read it from other versions. Uh, in case it will make some meaning much more to you. But before we do that, I want you to note that the Bible begins by saying, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this word, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, in, in proving what the perfect will of God for your life would be, the first thing is, you must come to a point of total surrender. A point where you have offered yourself, you have presented your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. 
the will of God will not come to you uh, when you have not presented your life as a living sacrifice, a uh, holy, when you are not dedicated unto the word of God, unto the purpose of God, you may never, never really get to know what the perfect will of God for your life is. Now, if you do not present yourself, your body as a living sacrifice, holy, the kind that God can accept, the issue is that you will have offered yourself to so many things and so many men. And the implication of that is that you will be confused because you will be having allegiance to so many people. In between, you want to make a choice. So the first thing we say again, as I build on this, is that in order to know the specific person, the first thing to do is to present your body as a living sacrifice to God. To present yourself to God uh, as a sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto Him. Now the second thing which is very, very critical, and I'm going to spend a little time on that verse 2. Let's try to check uh, verse 2 for me now. Now I want us to read... Uh, Romans chapter 12 verse 2 now good news says do not conform at only to the standards of this world but let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of your mind then you will be able to know the will of God what is good and is pleasing to him and is perfect a living Bible, the old living Bible said, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but be a new and different person with a freshness in all you do and think. Then you will learn from your own experience how his ways will really satisfy you. Thank you for that. Now, will you please read Philip's Modern English for us? Uh, Philip's Modern English. Yes, verse 2. Philip's not an English. Let's listen to how Philip put it. You could read from verse 1. With eyes wide open to the mercies of God, I beg you, my brothers, as an act of intelligent worship, to give him your bodies as a living sacrifice, consecrated to him and acceptable to him. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold, but let God remake you so that your whole attitude of mind is changed. Thus you will prove in practice that the will of God, of God is good, acceptable to Him, and perfect. Alright. Now we are discovering two things here. That one of the things that obscures or hides the will of God from us is the way the world system, the superficial customs of this world had already set our minds. You will remember that while I was uh, dealing with you resting and committing your way to the Lord, I said it is possible that you have been holding some certain standards. You have been saying, my husband must be like this, he must be like this, my wife must not be too short, my wife must be a uh, light complexion, I don't want someone that is too dark, I want someone that is presentable, uh, I don't want someone that is too tall or too short, and all of those kind of standards that you may have set for yourself. Now, apart from that, there is this superficial tradition that our mind has been filled up with, because of the world system. And each time the will of God is about to be revealed to you, these things will cloud your mind and discolor what God wants to give you. And as a result, you'll find yourself uh, unable to actually discern what the perfect will of God for your life is. So, in preparing to know, so that you can be as definite as Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. The first thing is that you need not to conform yourself to the standard of this world. 
what the world recognizes as important, what the world recognizes as great. They are not the issues that must preoccupy your mind. Is that actually uh, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, the more you open up your heart to Jesus, the more you allow His Word to remake your mind, to prepare your mind, to change your taste, and to change your focus, so that your own mind, your own thinking, your own concept of life, your own definitions in life, tallies with what Jesus Christ thinks about you. It becomes easy for you now to understand and to know very, very definitely what the perfect will of God for your life is. A man whose mind is set on the things of the world will find it difficult to know what the will of God is from stage to stage in his lifetime. Now, having said that, we will now go on and take some definite instructions about how to know the will of God uh, in marriage. Let me first of all begin by saying to you that there are certain persons that you don't even need to pray about whether they are the will of God for you or not. Who are those people that are marriable and those that are not marriable? Number one, the word of God is so clear about what the marriage actually is all about, which I discussed with you in the first aspect. I said, you are not entering into marriage because you are of peer pressure. You are entering into marriage because there is a purpose, there is a mandate that God has revealed to you and that God has brought you into that you cannot fulfill alone without a wife. So your marriage in the beginning actually is for a purpose. And the sister herself has been equipped by God to come and contribute unto your life for the fulfillment of that divine purpose. Now, so you can see that a woman or a man who is not born again, who as at now is still serving the devil, because the Bible says, whosoever is committing sin is of the devil. Now, a child of the devil cannot be a correct partner for you as a child of God. So the first thing we are noting, even before you start finding out whether you should pray or not, you don't ever need to consider an unbeliever for marriage at all. No matter how he appears, no matter how gentle he is, no matter how kind, how loving he appears to be, but he is an Egyptian. He is an Egyptian. He is not yet born again. He is not a child of the kingdom. He is not part of the family of God. Now, the devil is still his father. Except you are hoping to have the devil as your father-in-law. That's when you could contemplate wanting to get into marriage with such a person. If you remember 2 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, I must remind you now, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and this is what he says. He says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship as righteousness with unrighteousness? And what as com- I mean, what as uh, what communion as light with darkness? And what concord as Christ with Belial? Or what part as he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement as the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them, I will walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, this is very clear enough. Be not unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. As a Christian, you have been born again, and you know the Lord has a will, and has a plan for your life. The first thing is that that will of God must not be not gauged, must not be buried, must not be destroyed in affection with an unbeliever. The Bible says, what uh, concord, what fellowship as righteousness 
with unrighteousness. For you to take an unbeliever into a relationship for life is like you are going to begin to fellowship with unrighteousness. It's not possible. It's not possible. It means then that in your relationship, you cannot kneel down before God together. You cannot approach God together in fellowship because He is not a child of God. That's one. Number two, the Bible says, And what communion has light with darkness? Even your communion will not flow. Even you won't be able to have a proper communication in life. Because his own thinking is fashioned by darkness, your own thinking is fashioned by light. So, marrying an unbeliever is out of the question. You don't even need to pray about that. Ten unbelievers may approach you in one week. You have no business even considering them. The reason is because they are not children of God. Now, this is not negotiable. You may go here and there for counseling whether somebody will allow you to marry an unbeliever. I want to tell you that if you so do, whosoever permits you is only helping you to violate a clear word from the mouth of God. And you are not going to go scot-free. You are not going to go without blame. Now, look, one of the things that God abhors all through the days He dealt to the children of Israel is on equal yoki. He gives it as a clear instruction, say, Thou shalt not marry their girls, neither will you give your daughters to their sons, because they will steal your heart and take you back to their idols. Ahab, one of the reasons why he became a wicked man and he fell, the way he fell was on equal yoki. He went to marry Jezebel, the, the daughter of a Sidonian king. One of the reasons why Samson became a casualty in his life was that he, he, he was unequally yoked with girls from the Philistines. And you remember how the mother warned Samson and said, Are there not uh, women among your tribe, among your people, that it is this uncircumcised Philistine that you are going to marry? You remember what Samson said to silence his parents. He said, Marry her for me, for she suits me well. Let me tell you, an unbeliever may suit you well according to you, but I, I can see that there's already a well, a dungeon where they will dump your life. Something could not escape being a casualty, he lost his two eyes because of Oniko Yoki with an unbeliever. When he fell on the lap of Delilah, you know that that was the end of his ministry. That was the end of all that God could have done with his life. It took the grace of God for him. But you know he died young. He, he was cut short as a young man. And I can tell you, he had no child to his record. And by the time he was dying, he lost his two eyes already. My friend, I want to ask you, why will you allow a temporary issue? Because you are infatuated with a man who, is, who, who has not found his bearing with God. Why will you want to mortgage your life, my dear brother? Why will you want to mortgage your life, my dear sister? So the first thing is this. Someone who is not a child of God, who is not born again, listen to me. I did not say someone who does not go to church. There are thousands of people that go to church today, but they don't know Jesus. I'm not saying someone who goes, I mean, who, who does not go to Pentecostal church. There are thousands in the Pentecostal churches today, they have no knowledge of Jesus Christ. They have the language, they can sing, some of them can even speak in tongues, but they are not children of God. Now you need to be very careful here that you are not unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. Someone who is not a child of God is out of the question. You don't even pray about it. Don't even consider it. Don't even consider it. I may hear some of you say, but God told Osea to go and marry, uh, what is that woman's name? Is it Homer? Uh, a a harlot. Now, one thing I want you to note is that you are not Osea. And why God was dealing with Osea to even do that, it was still not an unequal yoke. 
God was simply wanting to demonstrate his love for the children of Israel through the life of Hosea. I don't think you are marrying so that God can use you as an experiment. I don't think so. Neither do I think that you are even ready to go and uh, face that kind of contradiction that Joshua, I mean, uh, Hosea faced in obeying God. Now, so, brother, I want to say to you very strongly that do not be unequally yoked together with unbeliever. It cannot be the will of God for you. God cannot violate His word. This is what God has said, and it stands all through the time and all through the days. Praise the Lord. Now, there are still yet others that are not marriable. The Bible says, Whosoever put away his wife committed adultery, and whosoever married her that was put away also is committing adultery. That's what you find in the book of Matthew chapter 19. Maybe you need to check it. I'm dealing with those that are not marriable. Those that you don't need to start considering as a young man or as a young uh, sister. Matthew 19. Matthew 19 and verse, uh, verse 8. Jesus says to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another committed adultery, and whoso marries her which is put away, does commit adultery. Now listen, as a young man, a young brother or a young sister who wants to serve the Lord, a divorcee is not God's choice for your life. Now that may appear so strong, but that is the word of God. It's out of question. You don't need, sister, listen to me. You don't need to be chasing a brother who has had quarrel with his wife and has put away his wife and the woman is still living. Whatever you are doing with that man, you are committing adultery. Whatsoever he has promised you, even if the man is a pastor, and I can see some of you young girls, because you are serving around a man of God, he is beating his wife, and you are giving him pepper soup. This man is no more sleeping in his house, and you are there around him, and he's promising you that God is leading you, I mean leading him to you. Because his first marriage was a mistake. I want to warn you in the name of Jesus Christ. Run away from such a pastor. Run away from such an evangelist. You will be committing adultery. Any man who is married and his wife is still alive is not marriable. Is not marriable. But if his wife died, he is free. Because marriage is the death do us part. But, so you can see, you can marry a widower if the Lord is leading you. You can marry a widow if the Lord is the one leading you. I will talk about such when I'm dealing with remarriage for singles who are already either widows or widowers. I don't want to lump it uh, in this for those of you that are yet to have any experience. Now for you that are yet to have any experience, any divorcee whose partner is still alive is not marriable. You don't even need to pray about it. You don't need to reconsider it at all. Just put it on the shelf. Put it aside. Put away and ask the Lord to show you His way. Don't let any man of God speak in tongues to you and get into a commitment of marriage when he has only put away a wife. It does not matter his explanation. If it is a wife that he has duly married, you need to be careful about getting into such a relationship. He is not marriable. So someone who is married but divorced is not marriable. The third person that you don't need to even consider about, you cannot consider yourself being a second wife or a second husband to anybody. 
So if he is married, even though his wife is with him, and he say God is just leading him so that you can be your help to his life. No, no, God cannot lead you into such a confusion. You don't need to pray about that. You don't need to even contemplate it at all. So, did you see the, do you see the people that are not malleable at all? You don't even need to pray about that. Put it aside completely. Because it is not biblical. It is confusion. It is confusion. Is that alright? Now, while I am very, very strong on this issue, I want to say to you that the reason why you cannot compare, I mean, con co consider a married man or a married woman for your own relationship is because the Bible says, Therefore, shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and two shall be one flesh. Not one man joining with two women. Not one woman joining with two husbands will become one flesh. It will not work out that way. The issue that God is raising demands that you start fresh. And God has a man for you. God is not going to bring a divorcee to your life. The divorcee has put away his wife and is living in bitterness. He must go and reconcile with his wife and restitute. And listen to me in case you are sitting in this meeting. You are the one who is the wife of a man who has put away his wife. His wife is somewhere and you are trying to get into a relationship with him. You are an adulterer and I command you to repent right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Get out of that relationship. Get out of that relationship. You say, but he's my pastor. He is not a correct pastor. Get out from that relationship. If he says you should be praying with him, stop praying with him. Any prayer you are praying as a single lady that comes between a man and his wife is a demonic prayer. And I command... A, a, a man to be telling you all the weaknesses of his wife. It will never help your life. You are going to come in between a man and his wife. If he has nothing else to tell you, stop going there. If there is no other fellowship to go apart from that man, you are meeting him every day. Stop going to that fellowship. Look for another church where the word of God will be taught and where your life will be kept. These are issues that are not negotiable. Be not unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. Never, never you come between a man and his wife in, in order to marry him. No matter his promise. No matter what he says. He may say, look, my wife is making me to suffer. He is really, really dealing with me. The truth is that you are not in the right position. You are not the one who can solve his problem. Only God can solve his problem. And if you walk into that relationship now, you have only created a problem for yourself, a problem for the wife, and a problem for the man. How could you alone be a troublemaker? Were you born to be a troublemaker, dear sister? As a young girl, when you were born, we were expecting great things concerning you. We were expecting that God is going to use you to bring blessing and bring peace unto our generation. Will you give yourself to be a troublemaker? I want to tell you now, walk out of that relationship. And if you are contemplating it, stop it. And if a man is deceiving you that he is not married, that's why we are telling you, you don't rush to say yes to any man. You don't rush, I will be telling you the steps to take, even when you are convinced how to say yes. We are going to deal with that in the course of our studies. But my first need now, is that such men that are not marriable, you don't even pray about it at all. You don't even give them a chance around your life at all. Don't play around it. One of the local proverbs in our language says, What you are not going to eat, don't bring it near your nose. What you know you are not going to eat, don't even try to smell it. Don't tempt the devil. Are you hearing me? Eh? A man has left his wife, his wife has uh, traveled. And he say you should come and cook for him. You are tempting the devil. So many of you, you are falling into the trap of preachers. 
of uh, so-called men of God, or so-called fellowship leaders, or so-called uh, evangelists, and in the name of helping him because his wife is not around, he has put you in a, in, in a difficult situation. He has exploited your innocence. I want to say to you, you must be wise. You must be wise. A man that is married that is still pursuing a woman, I mean a girl that is yet to be married, is wicked, is callous. His mind is not thinking straight. And when you see a devil coming on your way, if you cannot deal with him, you cannot resist him, what did the Bible say you should do? So flee from every appearance of evil. Flee! That's the only answer. Don't play around it. Don't play around it. Right. Now, if we have settled the issue of those that we don't consider for marriage, I want you to now note, those that we don't consider for marriage does not include a man that is born again but is not from your tribe. Because the Bible says in Christ Jesus there is neither Jew nor Greek. Now please, can you help me read from Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 and we will read verse 10 and 11. Colossians 3 verse 10 and 11. You will read it from the Living Bible very quickly. Colossians 3 and verse 10 and 11. Colossians 3 from Living Bible. You are living a brand new kind of life. Yes. That is continually learning more and more of what is right and trying constantly to be more and more like Christ. Yes. Who created this new life within you. Yes. In this new life, in this new life, what nationality, your nationality, or race, or race, or education, or education, or social position, or social position, is unimportant. Is unimportant. Such things mean nothing. Yes. Whether a person has Christ is what matters. That's true. And he is equally available to all. Praise the Lord. Now, what we are saying is that in this new life, if you are a genuine Christian. If you have experienced the new creation man, in this new life, what's nationality, what's race, what's social status, education, all of this is unimportant. What is most important and crucial is whether a person has Christ at all. So, when we are dealing with uh, the choice of a life partner, let me show you that the most crucial point to first ascertain, does he have Jesus Christ? Is he born from above? Is he born again? Does he have the fruit of the Spirit? Does he have the character of Christ? Is he eager to know Jesus? Is he eager to walk with God? Is he eager to, to live in righteousness and holiness? Not that does he promise to change. There are so many unbelievers that will come and say, Look, if you just marry me, I will change. I have been wanting to change. I just need someone to support me so that I can change. We are not talking of such. Don't marry a man because he promised to be converted. If he will have been converted, he should have been converted. And even when he's converted, that is not a guarantee that he is the right man that God meant for your life. Don't allow someone to be converted in order to marry you. Are you hearing me? When a man is converted, he is converted to Jesus. And he is in the hand of God. He is not your exclusive possession. Will you please make up your mind that look, Lord, wherever you are bringing the man, once he has Christ, wherever he comes from, his nationality, his race, his social status, his educational standard, the Bible says is all important. What is important is whether a man has Christ or not. Now, having said that, having established that on this note, we will now begin to go on and look at uh, how to discern the specific will of God, you know, for your life. Now, I have said that he must be born again, he must have Christ, he must be uh, excitedly following Jesus. It must be established in the faith. It's not a novice. It's not one of these people that just got converted uh, two weeks ago and you are ready to take him to the altar. That is presumptuous. Even before you consider a man for marriage, he must have 
demonstrated a sense of spiritual maturity because he is going to become your head. He is going to take decision over your life. And when he says no, you cannot say yes, you can't go on. Even if you make a vow to God and the man says, no, I don't believe in it. The Bible says that vow is nullified. So ever before you rush to marry a man, he must not be a novice. He must not be someone who just got converted two weeks ago or three weeks ago or even one month. Give him a chance to walk with God and give him a chance for God to walk on his life, on his character. Who knows whether it was because of you that he said he got converted and we have had so many of such, such very, very pathetic cases where people came to be converted three months, they are very excited only to catch one of our sisters. And once they fell into their trap, this man will never come for fellowship again. Said, After all, you have married me. And your Bible says you cannot divorce me. And he begins to misbehave. We have seen so many like this. Now I want you to know that it is appropriate wisdom that the man you are marrying must be a Christian. He must be established in the faith. These are general things that God will have you to consider. Now you will notice that he must be a person who has been weaned from parents and other relations. And what I want to say here is not that he has been isolated from his parents. We are not talking of isolating uh, brothers from their parents before you marry them. That's not what I've said here. And there are some of you that are misunderstanding that uh, yeah, it's you I marry, I don't want to know anything about your parents. That is not correct. It's not even biblical. We are going to see how to relate with our parents in marriage and it will not be a hindrance. That is going to come in its own way. But I want, what I'm dealing with is this. The man that is stepping out to marry is not a boy. It's not a boy. The Bible did not say, For this cause shall a boy leave his father and mother. A boy is still under the tutelage of his father and mother. A boy you are when you are not able to stand on your own. You cannot marry a wife and put in your mother's kitchen. It means you are still a boy. You ought never to marry a woman and put in your father's uh, parlor. It means you are still a boy. Now so, before you ever think of beginning to pray for a life partner or not, are you weaned from your parents? Are you weaned? Are you able to stand on your own? Can you take decisions by yourself? Before you begin to say yes to a young man, can you check him? Is he not still a boy? Do you want to I mean, deposit your life and your destiny in the hand of a boy that himself does not know where he's going? So marriage is not for a boy. And therefore when boys have come to you and say, I want to marry you. Now the first thing is, say, please go and grow first. Go and grow first. Even me, I want to grow. Now as a young girl, I want to say to you, why I'm not making it? A, a mandatory issue that you should establish yourself in a career before you got into marriage. But I would like to say to you that there is nothing you are rushing into in becoming pregnant as a teenager. There is nothing you are rushing into to get into marriage when you are not settled. A secondary school girl, for example, is getting into marriage. What is pushing you? Where are you going with that? What do you want to become with it? A young man that is just uh, going into secondary school, what are you rushing for, my friend? What is your plan? You must be not a boy, but a man, wind, and who is able to be able to take decision. He must be spiritually matured. He must be a man. It takes a man to do a man's job. May God grant you understanding in this, in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, Having dealt with all this, which are still looking very, very general, very, very general, the next question I want to deal with is, how do you know the will of God in marriage? How do you know the right person, the specific person that God is leading you into? Now, I want to begin by saying that, you know, from the passage we read in the book of Genesis, God 
brought are. So I want to emphasize the fact that you, the will of God is the first primary thing in, the will, in, in marriage. Now it is the will of God you need to first of all discover before you fall in love with any sister. When you fall in love with a brother or a sister, the, what has happened is simply that your mind has been biased. Your mind has been bound up in the personality, in the externality, because you can't fall in love with a man that you don't know is in a man. What you are saying you fall in love with is his externality. All of those are things you don't really know. Just because you saw a man or you saw a woman aside and you fell in love. Now any love that makes you fall actually will, will, will lead you to a downfall. The issue I'm raising here is that ever before you fall in love with a brother or a sister, ever before you become emotionally attached to a brother or a sister, the first thing you need to determine what is the will of God in this? Is God leading me into this? Is God having a hand in this relationship at all? The will of God, not how does it look. The will of God, not how you feel. Your feelings can change. Your feelings are, are a result of a particular time or a particular mood. But the will of God is eternal. The will of God stands whether you are feeling it or you are not feeling it. So the first thing you are dealing with is not, do I love him? It's not, do I appreciate him? Does he suit me well? That's not the issue. The first issue is, what is the will of God? Does God have an interest for me in this man? Now, which means, in order not to block you, your heart, from knowing the will of God, everything that we want to make you fall in love with a man, you must first of all put it aside. Now, what, what, what do I mean by that? The Bible said, gifts corrupt the heart. Now, when you start receiving gifts from a man before you know the will of God, the truth is that your heart will be biased. It will enter your heart before God points him to you. So by the time you are now, you are now praying, you will hear nothing else apart from the re-echo of your own heart. Now, so in order to know the will of God, first and foremost, stay away from receiving gifts from any man. If any brother came to propose to you, yes, let him make his proposal and go away while you take time to pray. But you don't receive gifts from you. Don't let him buy you a tie. Don't let him buy brazier for you as a young girl. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Don't let him influence you by his gifts. Some of the gifts I'm talking about may even be food. Don't let him furnish your house with their provisions. Tell him, no, not yet. We are not here committed. And I don't want you to affect my mind. Be polite while you refuse. So that you can be free to know the will of God. Uh, in the other time we were studying, I said, you don't buy over a woman. You don't buy her affection because if you do, Someone else may offer a higher price tomorrow, and she will be bound to follow them. Now, I again want to say, as a young brother, it is the will of God that matters first, not what does the sister do for me, not how does the sister uh, respond to me, not how does the sister cook or greet me or does things for me. No, it's not what she does for you that is the issue here. What is God's will in your life? If the will of God for you is that sister, wait for God to bring her. So the first thing I say, now that you are beginning to be specific, don't fall in love before you know the will of God. Now I want you to see what Romans chapter 5 says over this. Romans 5. Let's check Romans chapter 5. In Romans 5, you will notice the issue here. Romans 5 and verse 5. And hope make it not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Now you see, it is when you have come to know the leading of the Holy Ghost over a matter that the love of God by the Spirit of God will be shed abroad on your heart, even towards the girl. 
There is love that will come in. But that love does not precede the will of God. For example, when you check your Bible very well, you will only find husband, love your wife, as Christ loved the church. You can never find anything else that say, intending, uh, intending husband, love your intending uh, wife. There's nothing like that. We don't have such in scripture. What we have in the word of God is, what is the will of God? And when something is the will of God, God is going to pour His love, His delight in the will of God for your heart. And that is the way to grow in relationship. Listen, listen. If the will of God has not yet been determined, any special love you say you are having for a special sister is a lost. Because what the Bible simply says is that let brotherly love do what? Continue. Which means that all brothers, all sisters are actually entitled to equal love of Jesus in your heart. And if your heart is pure, and if you are living in correct relationship with God, you will come to prove that no sister, no brother is more special to you than the other. Except you are beginning to be disillusioned. You are beginning to have a different canality in your heart. But then when the will of God becomes clear, and you know that yes, it's not because I love this brother more than this sister, or I mean I love this brother more than that brother, or that brother than that brother. It's simply because God is saying this is the will of God for me. That's when your relationship can start. So now, entrances to proving the perfect will of God is when you first of all fall in love. When you first of all release your affection and your emotion before you discern what the will of God for your life is. Now, any marriage that begins on a foundation apart from knowing the will of God, what it means that that marriage has no foundation. It means that marriage is starting on something that can change. Because what you call love Actually, it's a feeling of your affection. And a feeling is dynamic. It's not static. It's not permanent. Sometimes you feel great today, and tomorrow you feel bad. Sometimes she does something and you are so excited. And yet, at another time, uh, out of her own life, she does something that you are not excited. And your love shifts. And that's why, you know, it vibrates. It goes up and down. As if, you know, it's a chameleon. But the will of God is constant. Because God is behind His will for your life. So in order to determine the specific leading of the Holy Spirit, now avoid taking gifts. Secondly, you need to give yourself a space to concentrate on God and not on the man. So how do you do that? You must reduce point of contact. You must make sure that He does not overwhelm you with everyday visit while you are still seeking the face of God. While you are seeking the face of God, your courtship had not started. And there is no need to begin to discuss or walk hand in hand and begin to say, okay, how many children are we going to marry? Some of you young men, this sister has not yet confirmed that it is the will of God for her to marry you. Why are you writing her love notes? You want to weary her, or you want to confuse her, or you want to bribe her? Why are you going about introducing her when she has not confirmed that it is the will of God? Why are you conditioning her environment? Why is it that you are playing a scheme? You quickly tell everybody so that no other brother could ever dream or pray or think about her. Why do you want to dominate her when God has not yet confirmed it? Now, if you truly want to know what the will of God is, subject it to the test of scripture. Subject it. Allow her to take her time to pray. Allow her to take her time to seek the face of God and understand what the will of God, you know, for her life is. So here we are today, as we are drawing, you know, uh, towards a, a time together. Now, because the will of God becomes uh, very crucial 
The next thing we are going to look at, how then do I know the will of God? How then do I know the leading of the Holy Spirit? How then do I know when the Lord is speaking? How then do I know when the Lord is not speaking? Now, there is a promise that I want to share with you before we undertake that, because I perceive that's a very big issue that we may need to take a little time to study uh, recognizing the specific leading of the Holy Spirit. But I want to start you off with a word of promise. In the book of John chapter 10, let's look at John chapter 10, and then we'll look at um, the book of Psalm, Psalm 32, and we will tie together there as a promise. Because there's a promise that God will lead you. There's a promise that you will hear His voice. There's a promise that since you are a child of God, you will not miss the will of God. Is that alright? Now, John chapter 10. I want you to move with me to John chapter 10. He says in verse in verse 4, And when he put forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but they will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. Now that's a promise. He said, you will know his voice. Now if you are his sheep, if you truly belong to the Lord, his voice will not be a strange thing to you. You will be able to know what is his will. And I want to say to you that, you see, knowing the voice of the Lord, or the leading of the Holy Spirit, is in marriage, is not going to be anything so different from the way you have been knowing the will of God in every other thing. So the way God has been leading you, the way God has been speaking to you, which we are now going to start studying eventually. I don't think we can do that in this session. The way God has been speaking to you, the way He has led you in little, little things, the way He has communicated with you, what He has used to direct you. For example, when you want to choose your career, when you wanted to go to the university, or when you wanted to travel somewhere, the way you started understanding the will of God. The way you knew that you should either give uh, to a particular work or the other. It's not going to be strange when it comes to the issue of knowing who the will of God for your life is. Which means, the first thing I recommend is for you to start, you know, working by the leading of the Holy Spirit in little, little, little things. Don't let it be because marriage is now an issue. You say, okay, now me and God today. For the next three days, I'm not eating, I'm not drinking, I'm not seeing anybody until God spoke to me. No. I wish that your working with God will be so continuous that you'll be knowing His voice day by day, moment after moment, step after step. So when it comes to marriage, it will be so easy as well. It will be so clear as well. Even though you don't need to be casual about it, yet you don't need to be anxious. Whereas you don't need to be careless about this because an important decision you are going to make in life. Yet, it's not that you are going to be curious. What we are saying is this. You should let the same Lord who has been leading you, is the same person, is going to actually lead you into His will for your life. Now, Psalm 32 says, and I want you to note Psalm 32. Now, these are the issues I'm concluding for today with. Because when next we now come, all we'll be dealing with methods. Methods of hearing the leading of the Holy Spirit as it applied to knowing the specific person God is leading you into marrying. Uh, Psalm 32 verse 8. Now in Psalm 32 verse 8, I will instruct you and I will teach you in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide you with my eye. Be ye not as a horse, or as the moon which have no understanding, whose mouth was the head in with beat and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. Now look at the word of God. I will instruct you. There's a promise already. So seeking to know the will of God for you is not as if he will not lead you. He wants to lead you, wants to guide you. Say, I will instruct you in the way you will go. And I will guide you with my eye. Another version say, I will watch your progress. Now, as I want to stop on this, I want you to rest in your heart that 
If you seek His will, you will know it. And that God Himself is eager to guide you and to speak with you in this. My prayer for you this moment is that you will never miss His will. So as you relax at this point, as you wait on Him, as you seek His understanding, now believe that He will lead you. A stranger will not lead you. When you are praying and say, God, show me what to do, it is not the devil that will come to confuse you. God will help you in the name of Jesus. Let us pray together on this. Father, we ask you to please cause your light to shine on the heart of your children. And let your wisdom begin to flow into them. I am praying that their choice of life partners will be established by your will and by your word. Thank you for hearing us. In Jesus' name, we are prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord. We want to thank God for the message that has come to us at this moment. As we continue on what will help us as young men and young women to marry correctly. Because when one marries well, he will actually do well. But when the marriage is wrong, there's virtually nothing such a youth can do in the future. The instruction has come to us from the man of God himself. And we have looked at the Bible, we have read the word of God. And the word of God is so clear to us as it, has, as it has come to us at this moment. What we saw here was that Adam was clear when he declared that this is the bone of my bones and the flesh of my flesh. So to you as a young man, to a young woman, you must also come to the point where you must be bold and sure enough to be definite and say that this is the bone of my bone, this is the flesh of my flesh. It must not be an assumption. And so one thing you must be sure of is to be sure that this woman I'm marrying, I received her from the Lord. This man I'm marrying, I can tell for sure that it was God that let me know that this is the will of God for my life. And so we're looking at how to know who is the will of God for my life, how to be definite, how to be so sure before saying yes in marriage. And then we saw how the man of God highlighted that there are some people you don't need to pray about when you are thinking of the choice of marriage. And the first of them all is an unbeliever. You don't marry an unbeliever. The Bible said that you don't need to be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. And actually, how can you yoke a bull together with a sheep? The moment the, sh the bull stands up to walk, the sheep will die. Why will you marry someone you cannot walk together with? Men that tried it in the Bible, we saw what became of them. We saw that Ahab, a wonderful child of God, married Jezebel, the daughter of devil. And we saw what became of his life. Is that what you plan for your life? What of the man of God, Samson, so anointed, right from the womb, carrying an anointing. The spirit of God was moving in his life. His doom was that he married the wrong woman. You can't marry the daughter of devil and hope not that devil should not be your father-in-law. It's not possible. He will always be at home and he will be devising things and causing trouble for your marriage. Look at a wonderful man of God, Samson. He died young, having no child. He lost his two eyes. Even though he repented, it was too late. He couldn't continue in the journey. He had to die. I know as a young man, would you like your marriage to cut you short? Do you want to die young? Then you must avoid marriage with an unbeliever. You must be sure that before praying about someone concerning marriage, that that person is a child of God. He is born again. He is carrying the life of Christ. That's the first criteria. If not a child of God, don't even pray about it. The counsel of God is that he cannot be the, your, the will of God for your marriage. She cannot be the will of God for your marriage. Another person to con not to consider when making choice of marriage is a divorcee. When someone has divorced his wife or husband, is not available for marriage as far as God is concerned. Allow him or her to go, and go back to his her husband or his wife. Don't marry a divorcee. If you do so, Bible says you are committing adultery. You are putting asunder between a man and his wife. And that is not the will of God for you in marriage. Another one is that you can't be a second wife or second husband. If you are doing that, you are only putting asunder. Heaven sees you as long as you are with that man as a fornicator or as an adulterer. 
if you are in a relationship with a married man, brother, sister, the counsel of God is leave that relationship. It's not the plan of God for your life. You want to mortgage your life. You want to, want to destroy the wonderful destiny that God has actually planned and arranged for you. And finally, someone that just got born again, a new convert, is not the best person to marry. You must wait. That someone just converted now and want to marry you, you must subject it to test of time. You must wait. Don't rush into that. Has he converted because of you? He may actually reconvert back where he's coming from. You must tell him to go and grow. That would not be the reason why you must rush someone that just converted. You must allow him to actually grow because he's still a novice. He has not grown. Now, there's someone that you must consider when he's coming to marriage. Someone that is not from your tribe, is not from your race, is not your class. That should not be a criteria uh, not to pray about that person. Someone that is not from your tribe can actually be the will of God for your marriage, provided it's a child of God growing in Christ. Now, the scripture came to us in the book of Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. The Bible says, in trying to even know the will of God for marriage, look at what that scripture said. I counsel you, brethren, that you present yourself to God a living sacrifice. Before knowing the will of God for your life, you must become a child of God. You must have surrendered your life to Jesus. Without that, you can't even know, you don't have a will concerning marriage. You must first of all be born again. Secondly, verse, verse 2, conform not to the standard of this world. Setting standard for marriage, using the standard of this world, the parameter of this world, to set a standard for marriage. He must be tall. She must be fair. She must be rich. She must be this and that. Now, those standards will make you not to know what God is saying in marriage. You have to discard all those standards if you must know the will of God for your life. These are actually what we are seeing this moment. And then finally, we want to let you know that God is willing to let you know his plan for your life in marriage. You know, we look at the word of God as we saw even in the word of God at this moment, the Bible said in the book of John chapter 10 verse 4, it said, he will instruct you. He will guide you. He will monitor your progress. He will direct you. He didn't promise to leave us unguided. If God had promised to guide you, surely he will. But actually for you to get this guidance of God, the way God will begin to speak to you concerning marriage will not be different from how he has been speaking to you concerning other matters. How you choose the career you are studying, the school you are studying now. How did you arrive at that? God must have told you. Now, when the issue of marriage comes, it will not be different. In the same manner, he will tell you the person he wants you to marry. If you will wait on him and allow him to direct you. Do not be like a moo that needs to be forced. If you listen to the still small voice of God, if you listen to the guidance of the Holy Spirit, you will be well guided and directed. What is the final implication here? You must have started having a fellowship, a communion, and a relationship with God. He must have become a friend to you so that when the time of marriage comes, it wouldn't be a struggle. You don't need to wait until when the time of marriage comes, you now start making, making it, being anxious, having anxiety, saying, I must hear God now. If you do that, uh, I think you will enter into error. The earlier you start living right, having a relationship with God, that's how it will be so easy to step into marriage without struggle. You must be careful that what, what, when you have not confirmed the will of God, you don't need to start falling in love first. You must first of all know, is this the man God want me to marry? Before talking of falling in love. Shun collecting gifts, shun unnecessary communication, sending and exchanging text messages, discussing intimate issues when you have not discerned that this is a man God will have you to settle down with. That will corrupt your vision. It will make you to dream about the person and that will be environmental dream we make, that will make you to marry wrongly. Discover first of all what is the plan of God for your life because the woman coming into your life is to help you to do well and to do the will of God for your life. The Lord will grant you help and understanding and give you grace to wait on him, you will not be faster than your shadow. You will not rush ahead of God. 
so that you will marry correctly and settle down with the person God has designed for your life. So that you have a good marriage and not a, a, an accidental marriage that will be full of tragedy. And we pray for you this evening that you have a good marriage. Can we go to God in prayer? As a young man, as a young woman, can you pray and say, Lord, I will wait. I will not be in a haste. I will not choose for myself. Adam received a wife from you, his wife from you. I will receive my wife from you. I will receive my husband from you. I will wait. I will not be in a haste. I will not choose for myself. I will hear you speak. I will get instruction from you concerning my marriage. I will discover your will for my life. Can you, are you praying for yourself now? Pray to discover the will of God for your life because God is giving you a wife to help you. He's a helper to help you to fulfill that will of God for your life. Can you also pray and say, Lord, I will not fall in love until I have discovered the will of God for my life. I will wait. Every relationship we are in now that is not the will of God, are you trusting God to actually break away from it? Are you already relating with someone who you know that is not marriable? Is an unbeliever. What are you doing in that relationship? Are you trusting God and say, Father, I'm ending it now because I will marry well. Are you with someone that is already married a divorcee and God is saying, that cannot be my way for you. What are you saying in prayer now? Are you promising God to drop it? Or would you want to die young like Samson? Do you want to lose your eyes? Do you want your marriage to become a tragedy? Or do you want to enjoy a good marriage? Which one do you choose? If you must not die young without a fruit, you must break off from that relationship with an unbeliever. A sheep and a bull cannot be yoked together to work together. It can't go together. Do you want devil to be your father-in-law? He will always be at home causing trouble. If you continue with that dangerous relationship, what you are not going to eat, why bringing it close to your nose? And we heard that girls and boys don't marry. It's men and women. Are you still in secondary school and already you are in a relationship? What are you looking for? You are looking for trouble. Are you trusting God to break away from that so that you have a good marriage, a wonderful home where you will be fulfilled, a home that you are going to enjoy? It won't come arbitrary. It won't come when you are starting with error. It will come when you trust God to start well. Can you trust God at this moment to break every one that you have not seen that God is leading you into so that God will bring a good marriage for your life? Shall we pray together? Our Father and our God, we thank you for these young ones listening to us. We pray that faith will rise in their heart to break up relationships that have been arranged by devil to bury their destiny. For them to wait on you and receive their marriage partners from you. They will not marry unbelievers. They will not marry divorcee. Every relationship with a divorcee is breaking now. Every unequal yoking is breaking now. In the name of Lord Jesus. You promise to guide us. And so Lord, you will guide these young ones. You will direct them. They will not be like moon. In the name of Jesus Christ. Everyone they are already collecting gifts from. Lord is ending now. They are going to wait for you. We will see them marry well. They will marry according to your will for their lives. Their, their marriage will be great. It shall be fruitful. They will not die young because of marriage. Neither will they marry to break away. In the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, precious King of glory. May your name alone be glorified because of what you are doing in the life of these young ones. Take all the glory even now and forevermore. In Jesus' most wonderful name we have prayed. Amen. Amen. We well, thank God for this uh, uh, version that has, for this uh, this month's version that has come to us, and we trust God that next month will be coming again, as we begin to look at the specific methods on how to find out the will of God for you in marriage. Do well to join us, even at that moment, by the special grace of God. Also invite all other young ones, all the youths around you in the fellowship in schools to be part of what God is doing so that they can actually settle down well in marriage. No matter how anointed you are, if you don't marry well, you cannot make progress. Invite your friends to be part of the next month uh, edition of this program and the Lord will bless you as you do so in the name of Jesus Christ. You can also call us or send us WhatsApp message 
or write us through, through our email and we'll be responding to your questions and to your, uh, your, your comments. Now, the number to call is 0818-959-1591. Get your biro or get your phone and type the number 0818-959-1591. Our WhatsApp number is plus 234-802-168-8888. Plus 234-802-168-8883. You can write us through our email address, abuja.livingseed at gmail.com. abuja.livingseed at gmail.com. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord guide you. May the Lord direct you. And you will step well into the marriage that God has designed for your life. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Amen.